Hello, everybody. Recording live from somewhere. This is Zach Couples with episode number Get Your Kicks, number 66 of the Movement Debrief. And tonight's debrief, ladies and gentlemen, is going to be scary. Ooh, happy Halloween. Do you like my costume? I'm a cantankerous bald man. We're going to talk about <coughs> chiropractic adjustments or physiotherapy manipulation, whatever, it doesn't matter, it's the same difference. We're gonna talk about shoulder abduction. Why is your abduction so sorry? Stay tuned. And last but not least, we're gonna talk about ending passive care. How do you make the people you're working with take an active approach into their own health and well-being and crush it so they can reach their goals? These are the questions that will be answered tonight. These questions were asked from the people. They're answered for the people by this people. Fan recognized fan. Before I dive in, are you wondering how you can improve your client's movement capabilities so they can better meet their goals? Or maybe you've got someone who hurts a lot of areas and you don't know where to start. Well, I can answer both of those questions for you if you attend Human Matrix because it is coming your way. Folks, next Saturday and Sunday, not this upcoming, but the following, November 10th and 11th, we are in Portland, Oregon this past weekend. We just had KC Mo. Whoa. Had some amazing, beautiful, sexy people become OGs. Everyone crushed it. Had some good interaction, engagement. I want you guys there so you can also join the OG group. Portland, November 10th and 11th. <clears throat> December 8th and 9th, we got Charleston, South Carolina. And in February 2nd and 3rd, we got New Providence, New Jersey. The early bird for Charleston is coming up, folks. It will be on November 11th. You probably want to sign up and uh, give it a shot, see if you can go. Also, if you don't want a human matrix set, maybe you're sick of listening to me, but you really would like to listen to Pat Davidson and Seth Overs. Two people who I strongly encourage you to listen to. The three of us on, uh, let's see, February 9th and 10th in Boston will be doing the revolution. Yes, we will be talking about taking someone from the lowest level of activity, the most stressed out bro or chica you are working with, and taking them to the highest level of performance. Seth's in the early phases, I'm in the middle. My boy Pat Davidson, aka Pat Tay, is late. It's going to be off the heezy for sheezy. You definitely want to sign up. If you want to sign up for any of these things, they will be in the show notes tomorrow on ZachCouples.com. Otherwise, let's debrief, shall we? The first question comes from Dan. Dan asks, my shoulder abduction has always sucked. Wow. And if I do see change, it doesn't stay long. Also, my active shoulder flexion is as good as yours, LOL. Yeah, that's about all we got. It's a work in progress, stay tuned. Anything you recommend that promotes promote some positive outcomes for most people whose shoulder abduction is poo. Thanks, man. No, Dan. Thank you, Dan and man. Shoulder abduction. Let's dive into that, shall we? So, we got a scapula and we got a humerus. Both of these things are important when you're going to abduct the shoulder. There's this thing called scapulohumeral rhythm. And anytime you say it, you have to say it that way. Scapulohumeral rhythm. Whereas the shoulder abducts, the scapula must follow. So there's a little, little dance between these two guys. For every two steps the humerus takes, one step must occur via the scapula. So they're you know, not perfectly in sync, but they still do a pretty good dance for most people, except for your broke ass shoulder abduction, Dan. But don't worry, we're gonna try our best to fix it. If you're limited, there's a few ways we've got to break this down, because we can either have maybe a humeral problem, we can have a scapular problem, or, oh, it's that thing that sits on the scapula, or I should say the scapula sits on, it's the rib cage. So there's your three-step process, but we're going to start rib cage first. If you want to improve your shoulder abduction capabilities, you must first make sure you can pressurize the upper thorax. First and foremost. Actually, before even that, we want to make sure lower thorax, aka infrasternal angle, can set 
the body into a position to allow for pressuring anterior and posterior and laterally in the upper thorax. This would be including improving pump handle capabilities, improving posterior thorax capabilities, yada, yada, yada. I've beaten that ad nauseum in previous debriefs. I'll make sure I link it in the show notes, though. Let's see, pump handle. Pump handle in the front, posterior expansion in the back. Get that. Ways we do that, if you need pump handle, arms out overhead, you want to make things eccentric on the front. So the anterior ribs and the sternum can move up. Posterior thorax, reach forward, close down the front, open up the back. A lot of times that will put you in business to pressurize the thorax. So that's step one. Usually where people falter after that is scapula. For example, if I cannot horizontally abduct my scapula at least to zero, preferably beyond that, there's a couple areas that I could potentially be limited. That movement requires the scapula to adduct and externally rotate. It also requires the humerus to horizontally abduct. If you can't perform either of those movements, you can't even line up to be able to do shoulder abduction. So then you do something funky like hike or maybe you just look sorry when you do it. We have to make sure that relationship is restored. If you have someone who can't adduct the scapula, this might be someone who sits a little bit more slumped, maybe has a shoulder IR limitation. You're going to work on things too. Guess what? Adduct the scapula. Why? Rowing. Face pull. I don't care what you use as long as you adduct the scapula, restore horizontal abduction, and get the outcome you want. Some people might have an adducted scapula, but for some reason they can't horizontally abduct the humerus. For those people, we need to get things lined up, so to speak. No, that's not exactly how we think it works, but this orientation probably makes some muscles a bit more concentrically oriented, like your subscap, and that limits that. What you need to do for those people, do the reach across. Usually those people have external rotation limitations. We want to do our best, actually do better than our best, to open up the backside, get some posterior expansion, and maybe this normalizes the relationship between the scapula and the humerus to allow for full horizontal abduction. That only occurs after you've gotten the upper thorax to pressurize effectively. Say you've done that, and it still looks broke. Well, as I abduct the scapula, maybe, 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 I have an issue performing scapular upward rotation. Because when you abduct it, the shoulder that is, the scapula must upwardly rotate. Guess what? Your shoulder flexion limitation told me that, Dan. You don't got it. Because if you can't perform shoulder flexion, you probably can't upwardly rotate the scapula. What do you need to do to improve that? I'm glad you asked. Do things that promote upward rotation. What do I like? I like landline presses. I like downward dog variations. I like just stretching the scap manually into upward rotation. All of those things have been effective at restoring horizontal abduction. Once you've done that, if you still can't abduct, there's probably something going on with the humerus. A lot of times this may happen in someone who's post-op rotator cuff tear, although I found a lot of times if you restore that, all of those in a sequential fashion, usually the rotator cuff takes care of itself. But if that's still an issue, you may need to go through a humeral fix. Let's assume that we restored full movement capabilities. Maybe this is some of your basic cuff work, maybe doing some stabilization based things, whether that's arm bars, whether that's getting you stronger in directions that maybe aren't fully overhead or fully out into abduction, reaching in various directions, what have you. I would go after those things and then recheck yourself. That would be my process to restoring shoulder abduction. So to summarize, get the lower ribcage set by taking care of the infrasternal angle. If you don't know what that is, for crying out loud, where have you been? I'll link it into the show notes. From there, you want to get the thorax to pressurize front and back. Once you've done that, take care of the scap. Make sure you can get horizontal abduction. 
you'll cross-reference your testing of external and internal rotation to make that uh, call. And once you've done that, you want to work on scapular upward rotation. If all else fails, do some humeral work. And if you do those things, your shoulder abduction will be less who and more ooh when people see you do it. Dan, unbelievable question. The next question comes from Mark. Here's a little Mark has to ask. Big Z, what is your thought on chiropractic adjustments? I know someone who maybe is uh, in, a, in, a, in a restricted pattern. When they get adjusted, they feel way more cracking to a side that would be expected with someone in a movement restriction. A lot of times, maybe the neck cracks may, may way more when going to the right. Do you have any concerns with this long term? Could laxity to tendons or ligaments be a concern? No, no, no. It just concerns me since rotation may be at or near end range. Do you know any evidence that I could back this hypothesis up? Mark, this is a good question. Now, Mark says chiropractic adjustments. Obviously, physical therapists also perform manipulations. Both of these things are pretty much the same technique, but maybe the thought process is a bit different. And I don't even know if that's fair to say because I know a lot of chiropractors who don't prescribe to some maybe archaic-based explanations that some chiros may may purport, or even some PTs, like putting bones back into place, but just like the spine is not that is not that fragile. So let's talk about this. Let's talk about risks. First risk, especially if we're talking cervical spine. Now I think the risk is uh, much less other places, but in the cervical spine you have a risk of vertebral artery uh, devastation where you bam, snap the vertebral artery and uh, well that's not good. Let's just say that's not good. Oh, thank you. So um, that's, that's a, definitely a serious concern from the things I've come across in the research, and most of this I would say is coming from the Spinal Manipulation Institute. Those are the stewards of this research. I'll link them in the show notes, or at least they're pulling it together. But also realize that, well, they make money doing, uh, compiling all these studies. So there's probably a hint of bias there. But there really hasn't been any, there's been several cases indicating that maybe there is potential risk for vertebral artery um, dissection. Dissection, I said decussation, I meant dissection. Vertebral artery dissection, but there's nothing that concretely says you do a cervical spine manipulation and your vertebral artery is gonna go whoosh. Now, I think we've all probably heard a story or we know someone who's work with someone who had an adjustment and they had this and problems ensue, I get that. There is still an inherent risk. And maybe that risk is mitigated by properly screening your patients and also making sure that you are not doing manipulation all the way to end range. You can most certainly still get a joint cavitation in mid-ranges. And when I was in my residency, those were basically, well, the kind uh, that we were taught. Things that I would screen for, you know, if someone says, you know, when I look up, things kind of get fuzzy, I, you know, get like the, it looks like a television when I'm looking, or, oh wow, my, my pulse changes, or I feel a bunch of funky things when I maybe extend my neck and look, look to the side, you probably don't want to manipulate that person. Sometimes though, this individual may be, um, you know, something with like cervicogenic dizziness. And there would be other things you may look at in that cluster. If you're looking at cranial nerve signs, that could be another thing that could potentially rule out someone you might want, might, might not want to manipulate or adjust. Just be smart when you do it. That would be one thing. Like the big thing that we have to make sure is that we're not we're picking good patients to not do this thing to. Another thing that I think is potentially concerning, and this is more likely to be a problem, is the explanation that we utilize when we're performing these techniques. If you're using an archaic explanation that, oh, your C6 is out and I've got to put it back in, without fail, most everyone will, who is told that story, the next time they have neck pain, they're going to think the exact same thing and come back to you. Now, maybe that's a good business model because you're going to be making your scratch every time that person's neck hurts or other area. But it's not good practice and it's not 
congruent with modern science. So we have to give explanations that make a little bit more sense. If you read some of the up-to-date research on manual therapy mechanisms, and I'll link the study in the show notes, manual therapy mechanisms, most of what they're looking at is neurophysiological changes, meaning you perform some type of manual technique, and there's things that happen within the brain's systems and the nervous system that can help with pain and movement. That seems to me a much more plausible explanation, and this is true of manipulation. Are there some local things that happen? Yeah, probably. You probably get some alteration in viscoelastic, viscoelastic properties of some tissues. Maybe you increase mechanoreception in the joints themselves. Who knows? But we just want to make sure that we're not encouraging maladaptive beliefs within our clientele. Other things to consider. Someone has osteoporosis. Probably not a good idea to manipulate that person. That could definitely be a very big problem. We could potentially uh, fracture some people. Um, so you want to also be mindful of that. Now, the one question that Mark had was, could repeated manipulation lead to laxity in tendons or ligaments? I'm highly doubtful of this. I'm really highly doubtful of changing any tissue properties in that regard as a PT. For example, if someone stretches a bunch, they're probably not going to develop ligamentous laxity unless they did it while they were young and they essentially sprained the joints putting them at end range, which is what allowed them to be flexible to perform things like gymnastics or high-level cheerleading or dance, whatever. I think with the people that we work with who we might be doing some of these manipulations and adjustments with, probably not as likely to have those, those types of things happen. Um, I just don't think we're that good. I really don't. I don't think we're changing tissue properties to the degree that we think we are as clinicians. A lot of this is probably just giving people movement options as well as maybe starting to restore some early conditioning and calming the stress response or the response to some type of threat down. Are we really changing the tissues? Nah, probably not. So I really doubt that we're seeing long-term tissue changes with any manual intervention. So are they useful? There's research out there showing that manipulations work. Um, especially A2, I've seen a lot of good success with acute low back pain and, and the manipulation, assuming that there isn't any radicular based symptoms. There's research showing that manipulations can help with neck pain, headaches, tons of different stuff. So it's not that the people who do snap, crackle, pops are full of it. This stuff works. I've had it work on myself, I've performed manipulations with patients, and I've gotten some really nice changes. My only concern would be that we have to also, even if we utilize these interventions, perform things that are going to help that individual over the long haul as well. Maybe that's restoring movement options. Why did this happen? And we're looking at it from a movement standpoint as movement professionals, or maybe other things. Are we encouraging our clientele to make changes that will benefit their health in the long term. Just do a snap, crackle, pop, see you next time. That's not good because it behooves us to make sure that while they come to see us for this problem, they leave not just feeling better, but also with some guidelines to living a healthier lifestyle so they don't have to continue to come see people like us. We want people out there, not in here. That would be my big concern is if you have someone who's just doing the manual technique and then they're not following up with any type of exercise, whether it's variability restoration or even just general conditioning. So to summarize, Mark, risks for tibial artery dissection, do some good screening, make sure that there's no issues funky going on up here, watch out for osteoporosis, and uh, what else did I say? regards to chiropractic adjustments. No, oh, don't uh, educate in line with science. I got no beef with them. They're probably not doing any damage aside from those things, but you also want to make sure that an active approach is also encouraged when you're performing manual therapy. It's not just snap, crack, or pop, and them. So that's my story with adjustments, manipulations. Mark, unbelievable question. The last question comes from Dan. 
with an H. I've never seen Dan with an H before. Dan asks, great article. I believe we are not fixers as PTs, but people who understand musculoskeletal conditions as well. We help guide people to their goals through a collaborative journey where it's a mutual learning experience. But my question is how do you get patients to come to this conclusion of performing active care when they expect to be fixed and continue to push through their lives? Dan, this is a really good question. How do we get people to not want passive treatments and pursue more active pursuits, aka change their life so they are not seeing jokers like me more? This is really tough because I think a lot of the medical community is a find it, fix it approach. I got this MRI, I have this bulging disc, so I need to get this surgery, or I, my blood sugar is this, I need to take diabetic medication in order to drop that down. It's very reactive instead of proactive. Our job is to try to make this proactive so we can get them out of the system and on with their lives. That should be the, the medical professional's ideal. Unfortunately, in a lot of cases, that's not what actually happens. The way I do it, first and foremost, is setting the tone from the get-go. When I have a patient come in, I am very upfront in saying, thank you so much for coming in, blah, 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 blah. We're going to look at everything on you, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to teach you how to restore some of the movement limitations that you may have, and my hope would be that that evens out the workload distribution throughout your body and helps you with pain. So already, in the initial evaluation, I am making sure that this is you. And a lot of times I might even say, we're here to do this together, I'm going to be your guide through this process, and we'll also make sure that based on what you do at home, we'll be able to update the program if you can get good at this. And a lot of times it's just having that back and forth and making sure you let the patient know that this is what the expectation is if you're working with me. If someone is coming in saying that there is a passive modality, like maybe they got a referral for ultrasound. I did an ultrasound the other day and my coworker took a picture of me. So hopefully that doesn't get on the internet. But let's say that person comes in you can still do your ultrasound, you can still do your passive treatments, and in some cases, some people, that might be all they can tolerate. What you have to encourage them, though, is, hey, this is really good for minor symptom relief, and it also allows us to open up a window for a certain period of time to allow you to perform movements, maybe less pain-free, that might actually allow this to stick a bit more. I don't want to just put a Band-Aid on the problem, I want to make sure we take care of the wound, so to speak, for the long term manual therapy or passive treatment, kind of a band-aid. That would be another thing I would say, is you just have to make let, let them know that we can definitely do these things, but if you want to see long-term change, we have to take a more active approach to our care. Other things, and I think this is probably more important than anything, is just letting the person know that who you're working with that you care. If you let them know that you are giving them this advice because you are trying to do whatever is in their best interest so they can get out of here and on with their lives, and I make sure I say that a lot, if they know you care, then they're going to be more likely to do what you want them to do in order to meet their goals. So I think if you're a caring person, you encourage them that, yes, we can do some passive things, but I need to make sure you can do some active stuff in the long term to help bridge the gap to your goals. For example, if it hurts when you squat, then we probably need to do some type of squatting and clean that up so it hurts less. Then a lot of times that's all you need. You just have to set the tone from the get-go. I think a lot of mistakes that I made when I was younger involved eh, giving a little bit too much just to try to chase pain and make them feel good, or even me operating as though I'm the fixer, when in reality all I am is the guide and allowing them and teaching them to fix themselves. So if we can shift our mindset, make sure we exude that or, or put that out to the patient from the get-go, I think it's going to be a much easier effort to getting patients to buy in to an active approach. 
And I think even if you go beyond, say, movement, most people know that sleep is probably a big deal and important. Most people know they need to eat healthier. And you can provide references, research to show all these things if need be. Or say, like a lot of times what I do is I try to work with people on their sleep. Sometimes if you just educate them on active changes they can make and how it relates to their condition, they'll be like, oh wow, I had no idea that sleep, if I don't sleep well, I can be more inflamed and maybe that's a contributing factor to my pain. Yes, I will buy those blue blocking glasses. It can be just as simple as that. So to summarize, because I realized I was a little bit all over the place, set the tone from the get-go. Let them know that you are their guide, not their fixer. Let them know you care. Link whatever behavior you're trying to change to their goals and how changing this behavior can impact their goals. And if you do those things, a lot of times patients will be willing to take that active approach into your care. And if they're not, maybe it wasn't the right time. Maybe you are the right provider or practitioner for them, but not now. And you did the best you could. Thank you so much, Dan, for answering or asking that question. I think that's a good stopping point for us tonight. It's Halloween, folks, so I hope you have an amazing Halloween. I want to thank you guys so much for tuning in and listening to me. If you want to learn more, go to ZachCouples.com. While you're there, you're going to hit up my newsletter. I will give you four and a half hours of me talking, three related to breathing, hour and a half related to pain, 50 pages of notes, weekend goodies every Friday, and a free, yes, free acute to chronic workload calculator if you want to work on your load, load management skills. Definitely want to go there, sign up for my newsletter. I also offer services on that page. Obviously, I talked about the human matrix, and I hope to see you there, but maybe you'll want one on one with me. First off, we can do a movement consultation. Maybe a toy and you're unsure what to do from a movement standpoint, or maybe your shoulder abduction stinks and you want to make it better. I can be your guy. We'll do a one on one session where I look at your movement capabilities and we'll do activities. I'll be your guide, how about that, to restore your movement capabilities so you don't have to see a joker like me. Boom! I'm glad that you'll be there, Tyler. Thank you so much for signing up for Portland. I was hoping we would meet. Once you've done a movement consultation, you will most certainly most certainly, most definitely want to sign up for my mentorship program. Because maybe you want to learn how to improve shoulder abduction with your people or get better buy-in and it'll create an active approach with your clientele. I can be your guy. What we'll do is we'll do a lot of back and forth. I'll do my best to answer your questions, but also guide you to answers that are going to be pertinent to the people you work with. Because I can't work with them for you, but what I can do is be that guy that you can bounce things off of to best meet their goals. Definitely sign up for mentoring, or maybe you just want straight game hang out with my boy Tyler. Done a movement consultation. Thank you, Tyler, appreciate that. Appreciate you, my guy. You also wanna go for some online training if you want gains, maybe you wanna lean out, or maybe you're post rehab and you're unsure how to kick it up a notch in a Legacy style. I can be your guy. What we'll do is we'll do a movement consultation. I'll tailor a monthly program to your needs. We'll make adjustments on the fly and get you where you need to go. Definitely sign up for the online training program. Once you've done that, leave ZachCouples.com, but go to iTunes or Stitcher and sign up for the Zach Couples show. Because guess what, folks? There's 65 other debriefs. Maybe you don't want to look at me the whole time. I get it. Or maybe you want to look at me, but you also want to take me on fire rides. Definitely sign up for me on iTunes or Stitcher. That's the Zach Couples show. If you're there, please leave a review. We would like the family to grow larger. Once you've done that, you can find me on social media. I'm on Facebook, boom, forward slash Z Couples. My Twitter handle is at Z Couples. Of course, I'm on huh, that Instagram, baby. Zach, Z-A-C, couple C-U-P-P-L-S. C-U-P-P-L-E-S, geez, I can't even spell my last name. And last but not least, go to YouTube, search Zach Couples, and you should um, find me. Hang on, what's going on? Oh, uh, Jake, I can't see that on my um, thing, so what I will do is I will answer that next time. Uh, thank you guys so much for tuning in. I hope you have an amazing, outstanding Halloween and your beautiful, sexy, outstanding costumes. I want you to keep it real, but not to the extent where things go wrong. Stay hungry, stay learning, stay moving, and I'll see you next time. Deuces.